It's a very common hallucination for people to hear an auditory distortion. So there's a difference between auditory distortions and hallucinations, of course. One is purely without physical cause. The other one is the house settles. A dog barks in the distance and your brain can't quite process it. And what people mostly hear is their own name being called from a distance, softly whispered. Our brain wants to, where if it hears a sound, it's gonna say, that was close enough to a voice and close enough to a word that that's how I'm going to interpret it. You must be some kind of therapist. I am some kind of therapist, and I'm about to take you on a journey through the inner wilderness. I've invited brilliant guests from all walks of life to join me as we investigate, illuminate, and inspire transformation in ourselves, intimate relationships, and the social ecosystems we are constellated in. What you are about to hear may surprise you, so hang on to your earbuds for a hefty dose of sanity in a chaotic world. I am Stephanie Wynn, a licensed marriage and family therapist, branching out and building bridges between psychology and everything else under the sun. It's my honor to have you along for the ride. Let's get started. So my guest today is Benjamin Davidson, the dream wizard. Uh, He has lots of experience in the field of psychology and went from working in the mental health system to branching out into his passion of dream interpretation. Uh, So you have a YouTube channel. What's it called again? Oh, it's just uh, the name Benjamin, the dream wizard, Benjamin, the dream wizard had to, had to pick some kind of branding and the idea of wizardry. Mm hmm is near and dear to my heart, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it's fun, playful, and whimsical. And a wizard itself is kind of a, a dreamlike character. Um, so, and on your channel, you actually interpret people's dreams for them. Yeah, yeah. So I have a kind of, we were talking about being organized. So my standard process, the loose framework I work within is, uh, you know, we bring the guests on, tell people who they are. They tell me their dream. I just listen. And I take ridiculous chicken scratch notes then we get into what I call the deep dive. We go to our second phase, which is, okay, let me, let me start again at the beginning and make sure I understand and try and see it from inside your perspective as much as possible. And that's where I start making little notes saying, that seems important. I ask for, using that intuitive side, ask for connections that they make, suggest connections. I try very much not to tell people, you dreamed of this, this is what it means. Like, let me... Let me rattle this doorknob. Let me see if this feels like something important to you. If it doesn't, the dreamer's never wrong. It either feels significant or it doesn't. It's on the right track. It inspires a memory. And you're like, yeah, I, I look for those moments where I see the little, mm-hmm. little, little facial expression change. And then between phase two and phase three, I call you a know, deep dive into the interpretation itself. We try to put together a story arc of the concept involved and how the dreamer moves through it. And that's, that's basically my process. And it just kind of happens on the fly. I, I hit record, we talk, and, and then we say mm. goodbye. And I try to make everybody look good if I can. But uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. that's what I do. So I'm imagining you've learned so much through doing this. And it's not a common thing to do. I mean, there was a time during Freudian psychoanalysis and Jungian psychoanalysis that uh, dream interpretation was sort of a more common part of psychotherapy. But I think psychotherapy these days is a lot more focused on practical tools like from cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy. These are all really practical tools for navigating life in spite of a mental health problem or resolving a mental health problem. Mm -hmm. And and there's a lot to be gained from that. But maybe uh, in the expediency of those approaches, we've lost some of the the abstract intuitive art and and spirituality if you will of something like dream interpretation so i'm really curious what you bring to this but before we dive in can you tell us how you got into doing this work yeah long story short too late for that uh this goes all the way back to okay i was actually thinking about that i try not to over prepare i always do uh, so i actually have to try not to over prepare so the first dream I can actually remember. And this is funny because memory is weird in general. Do I remember this? Did I make it up? Was I hallucinating? But I'm in uh, the house I lived at when I was three, four, five years old. I'm in a crib 
and my Wiley Coyote doll, which was as big as I was, giant stuffed animal, you know, for whatever size I was, it started to fly around the room. Then I started to fly around the room. Then we both went out the window into the backyard and that's when I woke up. So this is one of the few dreams I can remember. I quote that because I don't know if this ever happened. If some mm. part of me imagined it and upon uh, secondary elaboration, as uh, I think Freud would say, uh, I've I've come to view that image that as an mm. actual experience, which I have no idea whether it happened um, in, in terms of dreams. So long story short, too late for that. Uh, then, <laughs> then that uh, stuck with me for years and years. And I got to, so I've always had a fascination with dreams and I rarely remember my own, which is part of the fascination. Um, yes. So when you say you can't remember if it actually happened, do I understand that to mean you have no way of knowing if this was actually a dream that you had back when you were little enough to be in the crib or if you later imagined that you had that experience in the crib? Yes, absolutely. And that's very common with dreamers in general is that we get a lot of folks who, so for my process and for what I believe to be the best result from a dream interpretation is something recent. Last night is perfect. Mm -hmm. And I've actually had dreamers where in preparation for talking to me, they had a dream the night before. I'm like, I need to know what this one means. Something mm -hmm. in them said, you're going to have an opportunity to explore this, think about something important. And they brought that. So you go wow. 10 years back and someone says, okay, this is my memory of the dream I think I had after 10 years of remembering it. So it becomes less and less relevant, accurate, the mm -hmm. details surrounding it, the real life circumstances. Isn't that fascinating that we do sometimes remember dreams from 10, 20, 30 years ago. I mean, I yeah. still remember a dream I had when I was about seven years old. I can't tell you what I dreamed last night, right? But but I think that's fascinating that things stick with us. And I wonder, I mean, I had this hypothesis that one reason I remember this very particular dream, actually a couple of them, is that those dreams that I had at a young age almost foretold a story arc that I would experience throughout my life. So I've had these chapters in my adult oh. life where I'm like, oh, I'm in that phase of the dream. Have you have you witnessed that, that these early dreams we have kind of foretell an, a story arc of our lives? You may be the first person I've come across that said it that way specifically. So I've got, I have pre-Dream Wizard interpretation experience, just talking to people. And then I have my recent experience, which as of today, I believe is 72, 73 episodes, but go back to episode 71. And it's uh, enigmatic augury, I say, because she was describing a prophetic dream experience. And so mm. I, I come from a very rational scientific perspective of these are all the workings of the brain. This is all based on our experience. And um, as one of the authors uh, I've, I've recapitulated from, from uh, historical dream literature said is the, and I put it in my own way, but you know, the heart beats, the lungs breathe, the brain thinks, and it mm. keeps thinking while we're asleep. It's like the heart and the lungs do their work. Mm. Um, we just have a cessation of external uh, stimulus. Mm -hmm. I was going somewhere with that prophetic dreams. So mm -hmm. even though I come from a very rational scientific perspective, I allow for the possibility of, collective unconscious psychic energy, mm. seeing the future. What the hell is that? I don't know, but I don't denounce it. I just say, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what to do with it. Kind of outside yeah. my specialty. Kind of agnostic, which is how I approach a lot of things. And yeah. I, I enjoy having an agnostic perspective on spiritual or um, metaphysical matters because it allows me to entertain all possibilities as some kind of communication. Now, whether that's, whether there's some objective truth beyond our human understanding by which some religious or spiritual tenet is actually real on some level is beyond me. But yeah. being able to accept anything as at least uh, a metaphorical or artistic experience, I think leaves a lot of room yeah. for creative problem solving and just connecting dots and, and finding intuitions that are ultimately on some level useful or healing. But I think we were talking about your story, and I, I interrupted you because yes. you started way at the no, beginning. No, and I go all over the place. I Me don't I go too. way off on tangents. I don't even know. Where, I don't even know where to start sometimes. But well, so the experience as a kid, and then you know, fascination with dreams, and brought me up to college. Is that we want to go back to that story? Sure. Yep. 
Okay, good deal. Yeah. So I got into college and that's, so I'm doing my psychology study and that's where I found, hey, this is a thing. I kind of knew it was a thing, but then I started looking into the specific processes and we were looking at Freudian and, and Jungian dream analysis in my history and systems class. And a, an assignment was to bring a dream or two, try and apply these different frameworks and give an interpretation as an exercise. And I did. And the, and the teacher was like, this is it. You nailed it. The framework, the, the perspective of that person. So with that feedback, I had that. And then I felt also a resonance with the understanding I was able to bring to it. Then I spent 20 years in uh, emergency psych. And occasionally I would come across people who would say, man, I had this weird dream. I'm like, I hate like dreams. What do you got? And we talk about it. And sometimes I was able to give them, Hey, that looks like this. And what if, what if it means that? And they're like, dude, yeah kind of those little epiphany moments. And that was very satisfying. And then recently I just decided to throw it on the internet. I looked around and like, no one's doing this. There's people mm. who are like message from God podcasts and people who are getting spiritual energy from crystals and um, uh, astrology. Uh, fair enough. But this niche, no one was doing it. I'm like, I'll throw my hat in the ring, give it a try. See if anyone cares. <laughs> it, it looks like people like mm -hmm. it uh, enough to inspire me to keep doing it. So. And unlike those other types of sort of new age woo departments like crystals and astrology, you you don't have to believe in anything to explore a dream. It's just that sort of mining the unconscious, exploring the symbols that it's giving you and seeing if that's a reflection of anything that's really on your mind or a problem that you're trying to solve in your life. So when you say you worked in emergency psych, you mean like psychiatric inpatient hospitalization for people in crisis? Absolutely. Yep. That's where that's where the bulk of my experience is. So I've never done individual private counseling. It's always been kind of in that context of mm -hmm. immediate stabilization. Uh, yeah. But I mean, you do it long enough and you get a really good picture of what it looks like when people have decompensation or symptomology that ruins their ability to to successfully engage in in life and mm -hmm. what it looks like to slowly bring them back to a point where at least they can now go and talk to someone about how to how, how to do the next step so yeah. that was very very educational like great foundation and what does it look like for someone to be bipolar or schizophrenic what is you know depression and how does that arc recover back to at least stability uh, of mm -hmm. some kind yeah there's a lot to be gained from uh seeing people at their worst yeah and bringing just my my natural neutrality, I've got it. We'll see with the autism thing, my emotional response is very low. So I'm very rational with things. Um, so I'm able to be very just zen with stuff that kind of throws other people off their game. Mm -hmm. Someone who's overly sympathetic and this person is depressed, that care provider might end up in tears. Whereas I'm like, I, I understand the sadness. I don't experience that emotional resonance with them. And also the patient's with and patients with a with a C, not a T, uh, the the calmness and long long suffering to sit with someone who's manic and just listen to them ramble and try and keep up as as I as I talk too fast myself, uh, or mm -hmm. people that are uh, with dementia and and um, they ask the same question seventeen times a day. When's my wife coming? Soon, Mister Smith. Soon she'll be here. Soon. No worries. Mm. Um, I, I could just kind of be chill with that. Uh, so it was it was kind of my way of just being present for people. Uh, and I think it translates well to my to my dream stuff. I'm just I am in this moment. Fully. I'm in their head if I can, as much as they'll let me in to see what they're seeing and experience it from their perspective. I'm rambling mm. again, but that's that's what I try to bring to the table. <laughs> mm. I'm curious about two things you brought up. So sure. um, autism and <clears throat> dementia. So you say that you have autism and I hear you leaning into your strengths because you feel like the way that your brain processes social and emotional cues actually isn't just it's not a deficiency as a lot of people frame autism's differences in those departments. You really lean into your strengths and you see that your autism actually gives you some emotional boundaries and mental clarity that can be really helpful to people who are emotionally dysregulated. For sure. Yeah. And I definitely look at it as um, try and get out of the, shall we say, black and white thinking of like, oh, autism means you're, it's nothing but deficiencies. But even though I lean into the strengths, I will not ignore there are deficiencies. So I can't mm -hmm. empathize the same way other people do. So I miss things and social cues. And mm -hmm. I'm one of those people that I'll, I'll talk about anything with anyone. And sometimes that leans into emotionally charged subjects that other people feel strongly about. And I 
don't, and I don't understand their emotional reaction. And so mm -hmm. I say, what about this thing? And people will go, oh my God. And I'm like, what did I say? I really have no idea. So there's a deficiency too. And the, the best way to do it is to try and identify those areas. It's understanding. It's mm -hmm. a Socratic thing. Know, know thyself. You're going to have positives and negatives. It's all going to balance out in that yin yang. And if you know where the pitfalls are, you can avoid them. And if you know where your strengths are, you can swing on the vines. And mm -hmm. that's what I tried to varying degrees of success. <laughs> Honestly, I'm a little like you in that way. And it's one of my favorite qualities in the autistic people that I've known and worked with. This neutrality around things that other people have hangups around because someone's got to mm. be neutral about it and someone's got to be a you know to bring like a blank slate without carrying the messages that neurotypical people internalize from their social environment about what you're supposed yeah. to have hangups about what you're not supposed to say you know someone who's neurotypical will naturally pick up on those things from their environment they don't necessarily have to be explicitly taught every single lesson about, hey, you don't say that because this is how it lands with people. Although there's a fair amount yeah. of that in parenting, even a normal, quote unquote, normal child. True. Yeah. But I, I think that there needs to be a place for people who are like, what? What? There's an elephant in the room. You have a problem with talking, but everybody yeah. can see the elephant, right? <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> You're not supposed to look at the elephant. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Yeah. There's, there's that quote, uh, what do people say? So read the room. Uh, not happening. There's, there's a room and there's people in it. Reading the room, no idea what that's like. Uh, uh, but I respect people who can. And then mm -hmm. there's people of different takes on what that means. Mm -hmm. What is your reading of the room? And what is yours? And then I try and balance those out because mm -hmm. I don't know if I know. I don't resonate with either one necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So I get to that hyper objective state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you certainly bring a fresh perspective. Well, thank you. I, I tried. Yeah. I was also curious. You mentioned yes. uh, having a patient with dementia, right? And and a, a scenario yeah. that might arise where his wife has passed and he's asking where she is. So I'm wondering if you can clarify for our audience, why might someone who's helping a dementia patient not uh, confront the delusion, right? So the dementia patient thinks their loved yeah. one is still alive the truth is that they're not. Why would you say she's coming soon as opposed to she's passed away? Well, I suppose, number one, in my estimation of that scenario, she is coming and is alive. But he just asked the same question 17 times before breakfast because he keeps oh. forgetting. <laughs> in the, in the, no, this is, raises a very important issue because I do... There's two things I bring to psychology in general. Like we all have to kind of find what our baseline motivations are and how we're going to engage with people. I bring unconditional positive regard. No matter what I do, it is aimed at your benefit, the, the client's benefit. And I, I wish nothing but the best for you. And, and number two is genuineness. And that really leans into honesty as well. So let's say another example, a schizophrenic person says, I see this. And I would say, I believe you. I believe you see that. And I would say, I don't. And that's mm -hmm. as, as honest without telling them you are wrong. You don't see mm -hmm. that. Uh, and there's reasons why I believe they do. So that in my estimate, so in the circumstance that a dementia patient is believing their wife is still alive, I might not confront them directly, but I also wouldn't make promises that they're coming. I, mm. I can't, I'm struggling at the moment to dig out an example of how mm -hmm. I would approach it, possibly distraction. Um, uh, let me let me check on that for you, and I'll get back to you. Mm. I, I, that's technically honest without, because mm -hmm. I, I I would consider it a cruelty to have a person who forgets their wife is dead, and you remind them seventeen yeah. times a day, and they have to re-experience that trauma yeah. over and over. I I would probably mm -hmm. just kind of dance around it for their own sake, yeah. and feel morally conflicted about my obfuscation, but trying to avoid harm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is how I would handle it. Yeah. I think that's a good point because at that point in a person's life, wow. if they're in a hospital, not much is going on or, or nursing home or care facility and not much is going on in their day-to-day -day yeah. world. It's kind of boring or maybe they're physically incapacitated. Most of life at that point is mental. It's the inner world. And it's a time in life where dementia or not, memories play a really crucial role. 
and reflecting on one's life and hopefully cherishing some good times with some loved ones. And so it seems like yeah. maybe that is the most important thing for an elderly person with dementia whose loved one has passed away is to relish those memories and live in that state of bliss that it gives them to, you know, feel like their husband or wife of 50 years is just this part of them still. And and I think if I were left to choose, you know, if I were placed in that situation where, okay, Stephanie, you're going to be 85 with dementia and your husband's passed away and uh, you keep forgetting that and there's someone helping you, would you rather every time you forget it be told that he's passed away or would you rather live in your head and your happy memory is always thinking that he's just running late? And I think I would probably choose the latter. Yeah, especially when it serves no useful purpose. If there's, uh, you know, we're going to the schizophrenic side of things. If someone believes they see a bridge is out and they're going to slam on the brakes and cause an accident, you might want to say, trust me, keep driving. Uh, that's, a, that's a tough one because right. imagine someone tells you that and you'd see the bridge is out and they're like, keep driving, it's fine. But uh, when there's mm -hmm. no useful purpose to be served by traumatizing someone unnecessarily, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't lean into that. <laughs> we choose mm -hmm. a different way. I was yeah. inspired by you to des describe me like, and this is how my brain percolates too. I say something five minutes ago and it hasn't stopped spinning. How would mm -hmm. I handle that situation? I might say, your wife, tell me about her. What's uh, mm -hmm. What are you thinking? Uh, what did you guys enjoy doing? And all of a sudden he's back in his memories telling me mm. about where he was, <clears throat> what they did, their honeymoon. And he's yeah. not thinking about when is she going to show up anymore? So, yeah. Like that sounds like a nice way to spend <laughs> old age. Yeah. And, and talking yeah. about working with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, um, mm. in either case where someone has hallucinations and delusions, I agree with you that mm. It's, it's, I think, a positive response if someone says, I see this or I hear that, to, to say, I believe you, because that is what their brain is doing. And they're telling you their subjective experience of seeing this or hearing that. And you can also ha be present with them with boundaries and give a little bit of gentle reality testing by saying, I don't see that. I had a schizoaffective patient I worked with for a long time who I used that approach with. And this person's family was very grounded in reality and and their main mm -hmm. caretaker would kind of confront and say, no, you have this diagnosis. This isn't real. And from a mental health standpoint, and when considering that this person's going to live with this condition for the rest of their life, and they're not going to have so many of the things that a person longs for, like a partner and a meaningful career and independence, if they're going to be spending most of their time living in their head, then we have to work with the state that they're in and try to make it less yeah. miserable because people experiencing psychosis can have such a wide range of experiences. Um, there was some, there were some studies done on this that I thought were really fascinating where they looked at the content of delusions and hallucinations and people in different cultures. And if I recall correctly, uh, in this country, uh, the U.S., the hallucinations and delusions were more um, violent, whereas somewhere in Asia, I think it was um, somewhere in India or one of the surrounding countries, um, the content was more about uh, sex and food. Um, <laughs> and if you look at people with psychosis yeah. in different cultural contexts how the what the culture is obsessed with and, and or repressing uh, as well as how the culture around the person responds to the content of the delusions or hallucinations affect the quality of life for that person in terms of their inner mental world for and sure. what they're actually experiencing day to day so with this particular oh, yeah. schizoaffective patient that i worked with there were a wide range of sort of entities that this person had as part of their day to day life some of them were demonic. Some of them were angelic. Some of them were demons mm -hmm. posing as angels and then tricking them. And uh, and some of them were just cute and friendly like pets. And and so I, yeah. I wanted to experiment with how do we help this person gain a little bit more control over just their experience of how are these uh, hallucinations treating them? Right. So it's, a, you know, yeah. if, if I, again, putting myself in that position, if 
I had to live with a, a psychotic illness. I would rather be surrounded by cute, fuzzy creatures that want to play with me than with like yeah. demons that are tricking me and demanding and threatening, right? So I would actually yeah, work with skills like, okay, so when this really aggressive, hostile demon comes and demands that you make it food, which is a thing that would happen, you know, my patient would actually make food yeah. for this entity and then leave it out and the family would be upset because they were wasting food. Uh, you know, if I yeah. were having that experience, I would want to say, I don't like being treated that way. I'm sorry you're hungry, but I don't have food for you. There's a shelter down the street that gives out free meals. Have you thought about going there? <laughs> I would think about, you know, sure. how do you set yeah. boundaries? And we started with experimenting with the friendly creatures because they were the most amenable. And my patient would actually hallucinate yeah. while I was in the room. And what they would see was that these friendly creatures really liked me and would want to like climb up on my lap and play with my stuff. Aww. Yeah. And so <laughs> I worked with that to see if my client could gain any control, like by asking them to kindly sit in a certain place for a few minutes, almost as if you were working with like a three-year-old child. And it turned yeah. out that with the friendliest of the creatures that my client hallucinated, um, they were more receptive to being directed as you would with a child or a pet. So my hope was that we would be actually able to build from there and have the client practice this at home, practice kind of, okay, cute creatures, will you kindly stay in this room while I go and hang out with my family in the other room? Because I really want to concentrate on this movie we're going to watch. And unfortunately, there just wasn't enough kind of daily support. And as you know, when someone has that kind of illness, they're mem they have very little memory, so they can't really internalize things from therapy yeah. and take them home and practice them. But I thought that was fascinating. And, and this person reported that the type of help that I offered was more um, helpful for them than, you know, anything that's a little bit more reality-based because I was meeting them in the experience that they're having in their day-to-day -day life and what their brain is doing yeah. and how to work with that. Well, that reminds me of uh, two two stories that shaped my understanding. Both of them happened in emergency psych, so uh, in both relatively early within the first, say, five years of my career there. There was a guy, and he would walk up and down the halls constantly, pacing, 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 laughing at nothing. He said, I hear voices. I said, well, what do you hear? And he says, they tell me jokes. I said, would you want them to stop? And he's like, no, they're hilarious. And I'm like, okay, here's a guy. I see from the outside, this is a problem. It does interrupt his life. There's consequences to it. But his experience of it is positive. Overall, these are friendly voices telling him jokes and they make him laugh. He's having a good old time. Now, in our functional society, he's not going to hold a job with that. We're going to have to take care of him. But at least it's not demons screaming in his ear. It's a very, mm -hmm. very important distinction that, that these mm -hmm. people um, who do have these experiences, they can be widely, widely different. And then on the point of these being actual experiences, I got recommended a book, and I can't remember how I came across it, but it's by Javier Amador. It's called I'm Not, I'm, I'm Not Sick, I Don't Need Help, I think is what it's called. It's been a long, long time since I read it, but that was uh, his experience as a clinical psychologist work with his schizophrenic brother. And that's a direct quote from his brother's. He kept confronting, 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 and this person's, his brother's experience was I'm not sick. I don't have a problem. And th there's been a shift and maybe not broad enough in, in psychology itself, certainly since the 50s, get, getting better now. But the idea of shifting away from confrontation to break through resistance to the perspective that this is a real experience. And we've been able to confirm it with uh, functional MRI testing where someone says they're in the machine. They say, I hear voices now. Their auditory processing center lights up. It is as if something's in the environment and it's processing it in their brain. And I'm like, okay, it's real. It's not physical. It's not actual. It's not tangible, but it is real. It is a real experience that people are having. And that blew my mind. Those, those two things changed everything. Uh, and and uh, I've tried to carry those messages, you know, in training new, new hires uh, to, to do my same job and in helping psychiatric nurses parse the difference between I need to control this person's behavior for their own good by confrontation and direction to acceptance and understanding to finesse a positive result from mm. 
you work with what you got. You know, you got clay, mm-hmm. you sculpt clay, you got wood, you carve wood. You mm-hmm. got to work work with the material you, uh, you have. So mm-hmm. that's my story. <laughs> I love that. By your comments. And while we're on the subject of <laughs> hallucinations, can we talk about hypnagogic and mm-hmm. hypnopompic hallucinations for a moment? Sure. That is actually some of the stuff. And I keep, uh, keep pointing to the books here. This has been my master class in dream interpretation. Like, these are the books that everyone, I would say, should study if you really want to understand. And that's why, specifically why I've been reproducing them. Type them all out, you know, by hand, editing. And talk about hypnagogic and hypnopompic um, hallucinations and the development from the early 1800s uh, into the early 1900s of understanding, you know, what is what is a trance? What is it? What does it mean to be sleepwalking? You know, these... Um, mm somnambulism itself used to have a much broader term encompassing everything, including nocturnal enuresis. But you maybe you had uh, specific questions and I jumped in. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's wonderful to know that you have so much experience and knowledge that you've actually written about this. I don't know that because I haven't written your, I haven't read your books. And, you know, when I throw out terms like hypnagogic and hypnopompic, I was taking a chance on you knowing those terms because most people don't. But I figured he has enough experience in this realm. He probably knows, but it turns out you've actually written about them. So just to clarify for our audience who's never heard these terms before. So these are hallucinations that occur in the context of falling asleep or waking up. Can you remind me which one's which? I always get them confused. I don't have the definitions off the top of my head. First, I got to clarify, these are reproductions of historical dream literature. So when I have this book here, uh, my first one, this was the manuscript written by a French knight in 1669, and it's reproduced now. So what I'm going through is reproducing lost works of historical dream literature. And these guys are all referencing the giants in the game and philosophical perspectives and the transition from the spiritual supernatural understanding of dreams to the medical physiological understanding of how they work. This is a, this is my own designed course of study. So to speak, if I were, if I were to teach mm-hmm. a college class to get a master's in dream interpretation, this is what I would, the source material I would go to, to help people understand it. So they're not actually original works. I don't want to leave anyone okay. with the wrong impression. That is so cool though. This one is The Mystery of Dreams. It is a sermon given by an English preacher from 1658. And this is a, a, my, a second book in the ABC series. And what it does is it looks at specifically that spiritual, supernatural side, which was common at the time. This is what people broadly believe. Dreams come from God or they are temptations from the devil. And this is how to, his, his recommendations on how to use a biblical scriptural approach to tell the difference and make sure it doesn't lead you down the garden path to behaving badly. Um, But then we get into some other stuff, Studies and Dreams, book six. This was from 1921, Mrs. Mary Arnold Forster. And this is where, so it's a little double entendre title, Studies in Dreams. It is studying the phenomena of dreams and also studies she conducted on her own dreams and her experience Mm -hmm. of lucid dreaming and being able to say dream program and tell people how to do what she did and the experiences of flying dreams and different things. So this is where I'm getting my broad chronological understanding of these, these different topics and reading basically everything that's ever been written. And I'm putting off the more common works in publication and and trying to find works that maybe other people aren't aware of that aren't already cluttering the Amazon bookshelf. Everyone wants to do a reproduction of Freud's, dream book, you know. <laughs> that is really cool that you're doing well, that's, that. Yeah, that you're that's my work. Plumbing the archives of books written centuries ago and and bringing that knowledge back and offering it to people. So I'm bookmarking a couple things to yeah. come back to. I want to come back to lucid dreaming. Yes. Just brief note on that. My seven-year-old stepson is a lucid dreamer. Wow. He plans what he's going to dream about and then he dreams it. So... Like That's one amazing. one evening he asked his dad to watch a particular video while dad was trying to get them ready for bed. And he was saying no. And he's like, but I want to dream about it. I need to watch the video so I could dream about it. That's <laughs> yeah. amazing. We yeah. got to bookmark that to come back to. But but I, I did bring up hypnagogic sure. and hypnopompic. So neither of us remember off the top of our heads which one of those means while you're falling asleep and which means when you're waking up. But for those who are hearing this and thinking, oh, my goodness, do I have psychosis because I've had one of those. So there is a higher percentage of the population. I think it's about 5% of people who have had hallucinations in that state 
that are not dreams and they're not waking hallucinations that people have otherwise not had any hallucinations in waking life. So I'm one of those people. I've never had any kind of hallucinations in waking life, but there've been a couple times where I was either falling asleep or waking up and it wasn't a dream. It was like I was there in the room, but I heard or felt something. So once I remember it was just a male voice whispering one word, the word was yes. It was just yes. And I was like, <laughs> what was that? That's freaky. That's freaky. And I, I wished, like, I wished that I had gone to bed that night with a meaningful question in my mind, like, should I or shouldn't I move to this other city? Because then that would have maybe been useful to me. But it was just Possibly. completely out of context. Well, it may have it may have looked like I wasn't paying attention for just a moment. I realized sure. I actually have a book with these definitions in them. That's why I was familiar oh, with them. So this is great. Psychology of Dreams by William Sebastian Walsh from 1920. And these are all um, footnoted and annotated. And with uh, I could look, go straight to the H's, look up hypnagogic state. And this is what I was trying to remember. My memory is awful. So we do not... Go to sleep immediately, however, he says. Uh, we must first pass through an unnoticed stage of half-waking, half-sleeping, termed the hypnagogic state, so-called from the Greek hypnos, or sleep, and the Greek gogos, or leading, thus leading to sleep. Uh, and it goes on to describe that experience, but one, one thing that also jumped to my mind when you were saying that was... It's a very common hallucination for people to hear an auditory distortion. This is not, so there's a difference between auditory distortions and hallucinations, of course. One is purely without physical cause. The other one is there's some environmental stuff. The house settles. Mm -hmm. A dog barks in the distance. And your brain can't quite process it. And what people mostly hear is their own name being called from a distance, softly, mm -hmm. whispered, words of that, you know, our brain wants to, where it's a pattern making machine. So if it hears a sound, it's going to say that was close enough to a voice and close enough to a word that that's how I'm going to interpret mm. it. Yeah. So you heard as you're falling asleep, the word, yes. Whoa, what? <laughs> yeah, that's, and so that would be a very good example of that hypnagogic uh, hallucination, mm. so to speak. Yeah. You know, that hallucination was not a distortion. It was the first category, but I, I had a funny distortion the other night. I, I can't remember if I was falling asleep or waking up or kind of between sleep cycles, but I was shifting in my bed and I heard this little like, like wrestling sound, very small. And I thought, oh no, are there mice in my garage nearby? Or like I, I interpreted it as, I thought, yeah. as rodent noises. <laughs> And then I realized mm. this pillow that I'm squeezing is made of down and that's the down feathers like crumpling in there. That's all I'm hearing. Yeah. But you're right For that sure. when, when we're in that kind of in-between state where we're not so connected to what's going on in our real environment, then yeah, naturally our brain isn't working in the day in the same way it does during the daytime when it comes to hearing a sound and immediately knowing what it really is. So that makes sense what you're saying. And that happens also with See, with me, I've got some hearing loss as well, and I've got this distractibility. So if I'm focused on something really hyper-focused, as I do, and someone attempts to engage me, and they speak words that are just sub-audible to me, you know, they'll say, can you fold something up? And I'm like, can I fold the what into where? And they're like, I didn't even say anything close to that, but that's what my brain heard, my best approximation. Those, those kind of auditory distortions are actually very common uh if you've got hearing loss say um hmm. and that also kind of leans into the we were talking about the schizophrenic stuff earlier auditory distortions of of the misperceptions of of indistinct sounds is also kind of a typical quality of um schizophrenic so they, they did a study where they played intentionally garbled words to to folks that were diagnosed and not diagnosed and the diagnosed schizophrenic folks not only heard specific things but gave it a higher certainty rating. They were mm. very much uh, able to, to put a specific meaning to it and give it a, give a high confidence level that that is exactly what they heard. Not entirely mm. certain what that means but in, in looking at what the experience of it is that no wonder that's going to lead to problems with communication, with, with functioning in the daily world. It just gives a better understanding of what they're going through. 
I hope you've been enjoying this episode of You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist podcast. If you like what you're hearing, now's a great time to like, subscribe, follow, rate, review, or share. You can also support the podcast by visiting sometherapist.com slash shop, where you will find goods and services I have personally curated to support your well-being and enrich your life. We're just building the shop, so check back periodically and feel free to suggest recommendations. All right, now back to the show. So Benjamin, earlier Mm. you were joking that Folgers should be a sponsor of your podcast. And (laughs) that was that was funny and actually perfect timing because I am actually sponsored by my favorite tea company. As I've been getting into podcasting, I've been thinking, what are some goods and services that I can truly stand behind? And I thought, well, tea is something that I drink every day and it's good for your health. It's good for your mental health. So today I am drinking this beautiful amber color of black tea. This is the organic Yunnan Gold Special from Tea Lyra, my favorite tea company. And I just want to show for those who are watching this on video uh, how I brew it in this sort of filter basket. And I'm going to show you what the leaves look like and how they smell. So I don't know uh, how many of our people watching this or listening have actually had the pleasure of brewing loose leaf tea, but this these are the dried tea leaves. Look how big and beautiful and golden and black they are. Uh, this is so much richer than anything you're going to get in a tea bag. That's why I love brewing loose leaf tea. It's very fresh. And this particular tea, their Yunnan Golden Special, smells to me like molasses and raisins and tobacco. It's got such a rich aroma. So this is going to really level up your tea experience for anyone who wants to try T. Lyra's amazing selection of teas. I'm partnering with them and you can use promo code SOMETHERAPIST. So that's T. Lyra. That's T-E-A-L-Y-R-A dot com. Use promo code SOMETHERAPIST and get yourself 20% off any of their wide selection of black, green, white, puer, or herbal teas. That's my little organic ad segment that I just wanted to throw in there. And now you're going to be watching me, if you're watching this on video, drinking tea for the rest of the video. And fortunately, I have an editor who will remove the slurping sounds from the final product. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> As I've been getting into um, recording my own audiobooks, that's part of become part of my editorial process is I do the composition and and whatnot and do all the footnotes and change update the old English spelling which the my first book you couldn't you could probably read it it wouldn't be any fun I've said this before but <laughs> my lately my editorial process is now the final step I read it out loud and catch so many little little things that I wouldn't normally get and okay what made me think of that was the idea of removing the sounds I'm, I'm learning this audio processing software to r- remove my own Mouth, mouth sounds, mm. which are some people find, uh, some people have a condition called misophonia. They yeah. have that physical rage reaction to chewy mouth sounds. And uh, I try to take those out of my audio for you, my listeners. <laughs> I I can simultaneously relate and not relate because I'm a highly sensitive person. And also when you make those noises, I, yeah, I have like a visceral ick response But I wonder what you think of this, right? As someone in the field of psychology, there is such a thing as psychogenic illness. There is the idea that if someone tells you that a condition exists, sometimes it's really helpful because you go, oh, that's a way of explaining this thing that I haven't put words for. But other times it can kind of plant a seed in your mind and you can actually become fixated and exaggerate the distress that you now have this name for, especially when you have these additional incentives like if identifying with that condition allows you to belong to a community or feel supported or protected or cared for in some way. So misophonia is one of these things that came across my radar a few years ago when some of my young female clients were telling me about their self-diagnosis of misophonia, and I couldn't really find a lot of information on it. So on the one hand, as someone with a highly sensitive nervous system, I have my particularities. Like I cannot hang out in a garage where car fumes have existed. So I find it shocking when people want to work out or play games in a garage. I'm like, I can't breathe in here. I have to get out. So I get that. But I wonder too, with misophonia, if, if the 
fixation on having this condition called misophonia actually causes it to worsen for some people. So what are your thoughts on that, Benjamin? It certainly can. I mean, that's a very real problem. And it goes right back to, say, our own training in psychology and doctors, especially medical students are very often told, you are going to see symptoms which you have. You are going to see diseases related to those symptoms that you do not have. Don't freak out. It's a very common thing for medical students to say, oh my God, I've got this rare disorder. You probably don't. Uh, mm -hmm. this, the funny thing with psychology is, in my estimation, in some ways, it's the reverse where you've got this thing where it's like, you're going to see all these symptoms and the, you do have them, all of them. We all do, but it's the matter of degree. And it's like the idea of, uh, I drink alcohol occasionally under certain circumstances. And I am a alcoholic who is destroying his life and gotten a wreck because I was driving drunk and my wife is leaving me. There's all a yeah. matter of degree. It's not whether the alcohol consumption itself is occurring, whether mm -hmm. the symptom, some degree might be present. So we've got this psychosomatic. I mean, the, the word may have changed recently. I honestly don't keep up with the DSM-5 because I have issues with the accuracy of its pronouncements uh, for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. But if, if it's still called psychosomatic, yeah, the, the suggestibility of humans to say this thing exists and to have, say, social feedback telling you it must necessarily be this one category of cause with one and only one necessary cure that attends mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, to have that kind of pressure put on people, it's very important in, in this field to be very, you know skeptical, as we were saying before, that scientific rigor. And... Uh, to allow for possibilities, but also to do rigorous differential diagnosis. And when you have, uh, say, categories of things where the only acceptable advice, clinical counseling per certain structures is you must endorse one conclusion, that leaves out the process of that differential diagnosis. What if it's something else? What if it's not this one specific thing, but something else causing a similar condition to appear? That that's a, that's a big problem, and one we got to really be careful of. Yeah. I think you gave a really understandable example by talking about alcohol, because that's something that most people can relate to. Most people fall somewhere on that spectrum. You have a handful of people who don't drink at all, but most adults, you know, consume alcohol somewhere on the spectrum of occasionally to frequently, and also know what it looks like to have yourself or a loved one or maybe just someone you know of struggle with real alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those things that is also tricky though, because, uh, and I recently posted about this on Twitter, maybe I'll write about it or podcast about it at length someday. But every time I've ever had to tell someone that they have a drinking or substance abuse problem, the first reaction is almost always, I don't have that problem because I don't do X. And it's always mm -hmm. some standard of having an alcohol problem that's higher than the the severity of the problem that they have. So I've never gotten yeah. a DUI. I've never drunk and drive or crashed. I've never uh, cheated on my spouse. I've never blacked out. I've never missed work. You know, there's always something that you haven't done, but that doesn't mean that you're not suffering from an alcohol problem. And part of the problem of alcohol mm -hmm. is denial. So how do you approach that without setting up a damned if you do, damned if you don't trap, right? How do you approach that without saying, Oh, you're saying you don't have yeah. a problem. That's evidence that you have a problem. Well, that's not fair. But I find when addressing alcoholism that there is a reason in bringing it up with someone, right? I don't think that alcohol use per se is problematic. But if you're drinking every night, well, some people say, I don't drink every night, therefore I don't have a problem. Or I don't drink in the morning. Or yeah. I only, you okay. know. But there are certain indicators of having a problem such as cravings and feeling out of control or feeling like that's your go-to coping mechanism. Right. So I will bring it up just if a client is telling me at every visit, I really wanted to drink when this stressful thing happened or I got it off my mind by having four beers. It's like, OK, well, that's a recurring theme. And if your go to coping mechanism is a substance, then every time you use that substance, you are not using another coping tool. So even if you're not ruining your relationships or your health or your career, your mental health will dwindle because you're not practicing other coping tools and you got to keep those strong. 
So maybe someday I'll yeah. do an episode on addiction. I just thought that was interesting because on the one hand, you're pro- providing this clear Great example questions. of how things can have such a range of how problematic or symptomatic they really are. And on the other hand, there's also denial and distortion, right? Yeah. I tend to go in my head to a place which the phrase that comes to my mind is, how's that working out for you? Uh, that sounds antagonistic, but it's a real question of like, is, I mean, you're the ultimate judge in yeah. some ways. Uh objectively from the outside, someone might go, wow, that looks like a problem. You got to feel, you got to see there's a problem first. You have, you have to feel like something needs to change in order to be willing to see that there's something happening there. So that's the direction I go with it is like, tell me about it. I mean, were you bothered by those cravings at that time? Did you find it disturbing to any significant degree that you didn't have what you wanted at the moment to give you the relief you desired? Mm -hmm. You were out of alcohol and you couldn't drink and it ruined your night. Is that working out for you? Is that yeah. how you want to live? Yeah. Maybe it is. Maybe you're not ready to change. Um, but if if it's a problem and, and we can agree on that, then we can start looking at what, what you want to do about it. That, that, that brings in my libertarian perspective to, uh, I don't, my show is, uh, my Twitter's full of politics, but my show is not about that at all. But I bring this absolute respect for the autonomy of the individual, the sovereignty of the individual. It's not my decision. It's not my perspective that matters. Mm-hmm. It's, is this working for the person or mm-hmm. uh, concomitantly, are they hurting someone else? If they are, I might be a little more forceful and say, you can't do that. That violates mm-hmm. someone else's bodily autonomy, mm-hmm. their self-sovereignty. That I'm going to call out and say, I believe that's wrong and you should stop. 99% of the other stuff is just, how's it working out for you? Did you want it? Do you want to live like that? If you do, mm-hmm. it's my place to say, I suppose. And my I would- two cents. <laughs> Yeah, I I agree for the most part. And I would also kind of counterbalance that by saying, again, the more we lean into a particular coping mechanism, however flawed or not, the less we're even practicing or aware of or thinking about other mechanisms. So it might be like, yeah, well, it's working out great because it's what I have. And sometimes it is, I do view it as my role to kind of point out what else their life could be about, right? Like that you might have interests or passions that you want to pursue or that maybe you think this is working out, but your health is declining and maybe there's a connection between your habits. And, and I think we also need to plant that seed of hope that, you know, this feels like a necessary tool for you because you are in a lot of distress and haven't practiced any other tools. And that's why it feels like, yeah, this is working out because it's what I got. But I promise you that if we work on this, if we work on strengthening some other tools, you will not be in this much distress all the time. And you will not feel like this is the thing that alleviates Mm -hmm. your distress. And I think that's a wonderful point, responsibility to, to, to know we're in a great, uh, the Spider-Man quote, with great power comes great responsibility. Someone comes to us as an authority on something. They're saying to us, I believe you have knowledge I don't, perspective I don't, you might have something useful to contribute. That creates a status game that therapists, doctors, everybody needs to be very aware of. You're going to have influence on this person. You need to use it carefully. You need to use it responsibly, which might mean tough love. I know you think that's working out for you. That's how you feel. I respect it. I'm looking at it from the outside saying, I think your life could be better. Mm -hmm. If you want to talk about it, that's what I'd love to do when Mm -hmm. you're ready. That's why we're getting into that respect. Respecting the autonomy is like, my, my role is to tell you what I see. And it might be something different than you see in that respect. Yeah. And hopefully offer tools. Yeah. Yeah. And respect for autonomy is so important when you are dealing with someone who's used alcohol to self-medicate, especially if they come from a family dynamic, which is often the case where they had a lack of control or respect for their autonomy. And it's very common in psychotherapy for, you know, almost anybody who ever comes to me wants change in some way. They're in distress and they're looking for a solution and they're looking, as you say, for that outside perspective, outside tools. And so people are often like, I have this problem and I want to change it, whether it's that I feel depressed or that I'm excessively relying on this habit that's not working for me. But there's also an ambivalence, right? Because if if all parts of that person were 100% on board with making that change, they wouldn't need me. They would just make the change, yeah. right? So so they're bringing ambivalence, right? And if I just join with that part of them that in internal family systems therapy would be called like the manager part of them, the part that's coming and saying, here's what we ought to do. If I just join with that part and try to move full steam ahead, then some other part of them is going to go into protest and sabotage. 
So, and then that part yeah. of them is going to get mad at me. They're going to project onto me that I'm an authority figure who has an agenda for them. And then I give them something to fight with. Mm -hmm. So that's happened to me. But I've also avoided that by, you know, using my education and experience with the complexity of the human psyche to look at the other side. Okay, you want this change. A part of you is telling me you want this change. Now, what about the part of you that won't let you make this change, right? And working with the ambivalence so that I'm not getting caught up in a transference, counter-transference game with the client, right? This is this is really fun. I feel like you For and sure. I can go on yeah. so many tangents, but uh, I do want to to really mine your very specific knowledge that you have on dreams. So I wanted to ask, how is dream interpretation useful or helpful for people? Oh, that is such a wonderful broad question. It, I would I would distill it down to that Socrates quote that uh, or well, it's from Socrates repeats it from what is written at the Oracle of Delphi, know thyself. So and at the base of it, I think that's what it's, it's the um, philosophy is the why of everything. Psychology is kind of the why of human behavior. So the broad purpose, and I actually just composed a tweet about this recently, the broad purpose is to give the person as much self-understanding as possible for the reason of giving them as much control over their behavior as possible. If you're unaware of a reason you're making a choice, you will keep making that same un choice unconsciously when maybe you don't have to. Maybe you will. Maybe if you understand it, you'll go, that makes sense. And I choose to do so consciously. In my estimation, it's always better that someone is conscious of why they do what they do to the maximum extent possible. So this is what we get, hopefully, from dreams. And that is right in line with what we were just talking about with alcohol or any other habit, right? That there are conflicting mm. forces. So it's about knowing all these different parts of you that are conflicting. So please continue. For sure. Yeah. And so that, that gets down, as I was going to say, my philosophy of dreams is that if the heart's always beating... Lungs always breathing, brain's always thinking. So we shut off external stimuli at night and what we're left with is our thoughts. And sometimes they crystallize into these image sensory experiences and what it appears to be and what I'm the working premise for, for my process is that these are the thoughts we think about things that are happening, things we want, things we fear, things that physically occurred and we're trying to understand. It's, it's all this process of trying to put together a coherent understanding, thinking through a problem or puzzle, um, which ends up being what recurring dreams are. It's the same, literally the same situation, the same type of situation that keeps coming back strong enough that we need to understand what it is. So these, that's what these dream experiences are in a way, is, is one particular kind of concept that occupied our mind during the night at that moment, and, and uh, we thought our way through it, maybe to a conclusion, maybe just to seeing the picture more clearly for what it is. I totally get that. And I also want to kind of push on that logic for a moment, because what about dreams that are fantastical? So like, I have a lot of really fantastical dreams that are like, mm. I mean, they're so amazing. And I, I hardly have any words for them because I feel like the word part of my brain and the dream part of my brain do not talk to each other. So I'll sometimes wake up frustrated like, oh, I wish I could tell you what I dreamed about last night. But sometimes it's as if I lived through an entire two-hour epic fantasy sci-fi movie. And, and there's great amounts of yeah. detail. I mean, flying is a common theme that people do in their dreams that they've never experienced in waking life. And another one for me sure. is traveling to outer space. So there's been times that I'm like, off of this planet. And there's all kinds of things in, that happen in my dream life that are, I mean, I know it's common. A lot of things that happen in, in the dream world would not happen in real life. They're physically impossible. But, but so what do you say about those dreams that are just more fantastical than anything that, that could consciously be tied to problem solving or anything in our day-to-day -day life? Well, I think they still are. And that's uh, it's an interesting thing to to parse that out. So that was actually, I don't know if it's in the 12th book or in the 13th one that I'm that I'm editing right now, which is why I love doing this, this work. Um, I'm really passionate about the reproductions because of the knowledge gained. The absurdity or plausible reality of a dream is inconsequential in a way. Because, and, th and this ties into the idea of dream books and the idea that one symbol, water, 
the sun necessarily always has the same meaning for a specific person. And the idea that every symbol, icon, visual, perception, sensory experience in dreams is unique to the individual. That's my perspective. Not that those things don't exist or if they are impossible to exist. The idea that that doesn't, doesn't make a difference. What it is is that each, in my estimation, each symbol has a personal meaning to that person. So for you, a flying dream may relate to one specific aspect of your life and how you conceive of that problem or perspective or the object you're trying to get a look at from all these different angles. And for another person, it's going to mean something different, maybe for similar reasons. I am very much taking common associations, common cultural understandings sometimes. And very often I check with the patient, what does this mean to you? I say patient. I have no patients on my show. We're just two people talking about dreams, but check. Uh, that was a complete misstatement with the dreamer uh, to say, how do you see that thing? And what does it mean to you? So the idea that something would be impossible in the real world is, as I said, inconsequential. It's like, what is that experience, that image, that sensory perception mean to you in the context of what happens next or what it relates to in general? So the dreams can be equally significant if they are completely mundane and everything in them could have happened in the real world and equally real and significant if they are completely fantastical. So I had one dream where this gal was, uh, she said she experienced the sun destroying the world, or destroying the universe, and her being on this odd floating rock where there was a house and family and picking berries, but she had this sense that she was going to live multiple lifetimes, that this explosion, this, this transitional destruction to it would, would eventually result in a new creation. So that's where I start going with things. It's like the sun blowing up is not just the sun blowing up. It's very often something personal to that person. What is in the broader context of what I assume to be common understandings of destruction, change, very much leaning into the kind of Jungian stuff with that. I hope that any of that made sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. I see how what you're saying makes sense and how it's coming from a wealth of experience. And I also want to hold on to the idea that sometimes dreams are just fun, especially because I've had so many stressful dreams. <laughs> like, you know, and and, oh, yeah. and maybe that's, maybe if you look at the overall story arc of my life and the fact that I used to have a lot more nightmares. I used to have mm. a lot of tidal wave dreams. That was my, I would say in my whole life, my most major recurring theme is tidal waves. And I've had tidal waves in all kinds of weather conditions, all kinds of social conditions, all kinds of sizes and speeds and like how possible it is to escape it or not. Like every combination you can think of, of tidal wave dreams, I've had them. And I've also had dreams where I'm like yeah. out on a ship and it's rocky. So that I feel like I get like that is about emotional overwhelm in general, right? So, you know, I can see that very powerful symbol on the and whole, a water giant wall of irresistible water smashing into you. Hard not to take away from that. I'm yeah. being overwhelmed by something I can't control. Yeah. 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 Which I think is how I've experienced a lot of life. So so maybe the fact that I've had these really fantastical dreams for the last year or two is my psyche just kind of celebrating, hey, like we don't have to deal with so many tidal waves anymore. Like life is fun and adventurous and there's happy things going on. And I mean, not that yeah. all of these dreams are, are happy, but there's a lot of exploration and a lot of awe. So maybe that says something good, you know, and, or maybe on the other hand, maybe well, it's that, an escape and, and, from how on the one hand, my life is pretty happy right now. On the other hand, the last two years have been a time where everything's pretty like there's not a lot happening in the pandemic. There's a lot happening with my career and my family life. But like, so I, there's also the idea of like, maybe how mundane and routine everything has been in terms of spending a lot of time in one room and not seeing a lot of different people or getting out there a lot. Maybe my brain is like, I need to come up with more diversity and like makes up these sci-fi sure. movies. Well, and you were also going to ask me about my process, and we're actually yes. kind of doing it here. We're talking about uh, you, 
okay. your experience of life, your dreams, how they've changed over time. So I was starting to get, then I started to get tingles. This is how it happened. This is why I call okay. it magic. This is why I call myself a wizard because number one, there's a metaphysical, the wizard is uh, iconically, he's the wise one, which was where we get the word wizard from. He is mm. older, more experienced. The evidence is the gray in the beard. Mm. He walks with the staff because he's lived a long time and his body's broken from, from time, uh, which gives him that magic power to speak magic words and mm. and see the future put the cause and effect together from experience mm -hmm. it's a very practical aspect of wizardry in my estimation so there's in this metaphysical thing where it's like oh yeah, i'm a wizard i got the hair and the hat and you know i don't have a hat i need to buy a hat uh one mm -hmm. of these days long story short wiz wizardry practical application you, oh so i get these tingles and it's magical i don't know where it comes from the muses mm -hmm. on mount olympus are talking to me who the hell knows that's a worthy metaphor in my mind that's what it feels like I start putting together things. I had a point. Yeah. Your dreams changed from earthbound and swamped by tidal waves to now flying in space on a grand adventure. That's <laughs> powerful change related specifically to your life experience. And maybe that element, as you identified, of incorporating, I am on a new adventure. What's my symbolic, iconic representation mm -hmm. of a new adventure? Unknown planets in space and free from this earthly binding where waves smash me. And uh, yeah, it all kind of starts to fit together. But then I start saying, okay, that's just the thoughts in my head inspired by what you told me. How does that feel? What do you, what do you get right here when I start talking about mm. those things? And people either resonates or it doesn't. And mm -hmm. it doesn't resonate. I rattled the wrong doorknob. We try another mm -hmm. angle. I'm definitely not coming at this as I am the authority. I know what you experienced and what it means better than you mm -hmm. do. I'm trying to help you Mm -hmm. feel what makes sense to you mm -hmm. in, in context. And what you're doing right now feels collaborative. Like you didn't just make that up. You were reflecting and expounding on uh, and associating from what I shared. And I'm also getting a taste from how we're dialoguing right now that you don't just exclusively interpret one dream at a time. Sometimes you zoom out and look at how have a person's dreams changed over time. What is that reflecting about their journey in life? How are you sleeping? Sleep is a foundation of mental and physical health, equally important to nutrition and exercise, yet it's often the first thing to go during times of stress. Good sleep can help alleviate depression and anxiety symptoms, maintain a healthy weight and metabolism, protect your heart, and even reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. Yet still, a third of Americans struggle with sleep, and temperature is one of the main reasons. Before I got an eight sleep, I was already an expert in sleep hygiene and practiced what I preached to my clients, but I would still wake up overheated in the middle of the night and unable to fall back asleep for one or two hours. Adjusting the air temperature and blankets was not enough. The mattress itself was keeping me hot. But now I'm sleeping soundly through the night and waking up refreshed thanks to my eight sleep pod pro cover. The Pod Pro Cover by 8Sleep is the most advanced solution on the market for thermoregulation. It pairs dynamic cooling and heating with biometric tracking. The cover can adjust the temperature on each side of the bed individually for you and your partner based on your sleep stages, biometrics, and bedroom temperature, reacting intelligently to create the optimal sleeping environment. If you'd like to be more patient with your children, more emotionally stable with your partner, a fitter athlete, or more efficient at work? Take it from me, a mental health professional. Improving your sleep is one of the best investments you can possibly make in your overall well-being and the lives of everyone you touch. Go to 8sleep.com to check out the pod and use the code SOMETHERAPIST at checkout to start sleeping cool this summer with up to $200 off your purchase. Even if they're already running another sale, this code will get you an additional $50 off. And yes, to my listeners around the world, 8Sleep currently ships not only within the USA, but also to Canada, the UK, select countries in the EU, and Australia. All right, now back to the show. Yeah, if they bring to me a recurring dream specifically, uh, and a lot of times discussion of a current dream will bring up discussions of past experiences, patterns that have repeated in their lives, previous iterations of the same dream. So if someone brings a series of recurring dreams I got to do one at a time. I can't do the whole series, but we start with one dream. Then we work backwards and look at, okay, how is this similar to these past experiences? What is the pattern 
that is repeating. And that helps us narrow down what is the question you're pondering? What is the object you're trying to turn and look at at different angles? And that that takes us someplace too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just love it. I just enjoy doing this. (laughs) So one of my other recurring dream themes is a house or structure of some kind. I'm sure you get this a lot, right? Mm. Where I'm exploring and discovering that maybe I've lived in this house for a long time, but I didn't even know this whole room was over here. There's always something different. And and sometimes in a dream, I'll come to a place and I'll be aware in the dream that I've been here before. And maybe I was there in a previous dream. But I wonder if you get that a lot, a lot of dreams of houses and exploring new spaces and discovering yeah, no, absolutely. That's uh, And it all depends. And the words you bring to it, too, the words you use to describe the dream experience itself. I didn't get from that this was a haunted house. So a lot of a lot of things I do with a differential diagnosis oh, I have of had discounting those. the negatives. <laughs> sure. But this one seemed to me like you were experiencing discovery, exploration. Mm-hmm. You're seeking the new. So I start going to those associative places with it. Mm. It is very common that if we latch on to, say, a specific type of iconography or hierography, um, this, this sacred imagery, a house means something to us as a place we live, a place that contains other things, a place to protect from the elements. Yeah, but I also look for the, yeah, the negative things. So this was not, you weren't scared in there. You weren't fearful to open doors. You were excited to discover. I never knew this was there. Very often we'll have dreams where we, uh, well, in my experience with dreamers, they say at that moment, I had the feeling I'd been there before their experience of past dreams, they've never had this dream before. It's not a recurring dream. Mm -hmm. That moment of familiarity Mm -hmm. means something to them in the context of being in that house, finding that room and having it feel familiar before they ever open the door. Mm -hmm. That means something. I put a little carrot next Mm -hmm. to that and we try and come back to it and incorporate it into the story arc of Mm -hmm. of what what I try and help them understand the dream means. Mm -hmm. I'm also curious, since you have so much exposure to the content of different people's dreams, sometimes I wonder about this. I very often in dreams am surrounded by other people. And every now and then there's a really powerful connection with one person. Like I remember the stream where I had this one-on-one connection with this person and I remember the light in his eyes. I remember the name he told told me that he has, which is not an earthly name. It sounded kind of Native American. And I actually Googled that name after I was like, does this mean anything? And there was a country with a location that was kind of remotely related. I don't know. Interesting. It was it was something like a Kerry Soshantaya Utangayu. Like that was something like that. But I I remember having this real profound, deep connection with this one person. But in a lot of my dreams, when, and I would say that's more like actually my daily life. My, my daily life is having profound, deep connections with people. But a lot of my dreams, yeah. there's just people around. And there's some vague sense of like, I, of how I know them or, or you know, the, the general sense that they're not a threat. And then I also have dreams I'm not going to get into where I am being attacked. And usually it's like one malicious presence that kind of sneaks up on me. But I wonder when I think about how, wow, usually there's just people around. And then I thought, I wonder how common that is for there to just be other people hanging out some somehow involved. Yeah, I would. That's an interesting thing. And a lot of authors have addressed that back to back to shilling my books. Uh, The Mm -hmm. concept of what is a typical dream? What Mm -hmm. what is the common human experience of dreams? Certain Mm -hmm. themes do seem to fly in dreams, very often cited as Typical, but typical is a funny thing to parse because are we talking about a statistical average, an absolute number? What does it mean to be typical? It's a common experience people have reported. Having people in dreams, very common experience. Being alone in dreams, also very common, which is more common. Oh, this is a good time to mention a guy. Uh, Shout out to uh, G. William, call me Bill uh, Domhoff, uh, former UC Santa Cruz professor. He put together the Dream Bank. I think it's called the Dream Hmm. Bank. Dot net, where he actually, he took an approach. So mine's a very esoteric, loosey-goosey, associative. He was more counting the instance of specific emotions, specific objects, specific people. So if I'd done my, my homework, which I'm going to get around to it, Bill, sorry for uh, not, not diving into your website yet, but we could see here's a statistical representation of how many people 
had a dream in which there were other people, in which there were multiple other people, in which they spoke to people, mm -hmm. how many people were present, all of these county specific objects in dreams. The direction I go with that is I would not at all be surprised you were alone in a dream. You're with, you tend to be with people. Maybe this says about you, you lean more into the social aspect of life that in your dreams, even your brain is saying, okay, imagine you're going to be around other people because you usually are. And in that context, here's other things that happen. So it may be as common as you're standing in a field of green grass because you have stood in a field of green grass before, and that's your iconic representation of an open space in which something else could happen. So for you, I'm in it. Okay, imagine context. I'm in a group of people, and now something happens that I'm thinking about, and I want to understand, or I just want to enjoy. And you did mention earlier that dreams are sometimes purely for fun. Mm. And maybe they are. Uh, Freud mm -hmm. would lean into the wish fulfillment side of things. Mm. Sometimes they are. I would say they are not exclusively wish fulfillment, but sometimes they are. You just want to have a fun experience. This was just a fun adventure to have, and it didn't mean anything other than I wish I could go to space and ride a rocket ship and let's imagine <laughs> that and have fun with it. Mm. It's also just a valid dream experience, which mm -hmm. may have led me to being unable to interpret a few dreams because they may be exactly what they are. They have no deeper meaning. This was purely wish fulfillment, in which case I feel useless, but I'm happy for the person that you had a fun experience <laughs> you enjoyed. Uh, that's, that's also acceptable. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, in, in my field, therapy, people feel like they have to come prepared with their problems. And of course, people wouldn't seek mm. out therapy in the first place if they didn't have problems that they felt like they needed help with. But when I've been working with someone for a while and they're making steady improvements, maybe maybe when I met them, they were deciding to leave a terrible marriage. And now it's two years later and they're really happy with their new boyfriend and their, you know, their job's in a good place. And there are just moments where it's like, wait a minute, you're telling me that you don't feel like you need therapy today, or not that you need, don't need, but you feel unprepared for therapy or you feel bad about coming to therapy because you don't have any problems to work on. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. we could certainly work toward terminating therapy in the next few months if things have been steadily heading in a good direction. In fact, we should do that. But hey, let's just take a moment to celebrate and let's take a moment to reflect on the joy and happiness and pride and whatever those positive emotions are, gratitude, awe, and ground that in right? Because reflecting on it, you can let that sink in and, and start to feel that you've arrived in this new place where things are better, right? So I think it's equally important to bring For our sure. awareness to those things. So on a light and positive note, I am so curious, yeah. what are some of your favorite dreams that you've personally had or that you've heard? Some of my most favorite dreams have been where People are very quick to, to feel that resonance with a specific suggestion. We get, we get, we, we hone in on the relevant stuff faster in a way that allows us to really paint a vivid picture. Sometimes the pictures are a little vague because people aren't sure how they feel about what we're talking about. They haven't made up their mind about certain things. They've, they're not feeling connections. I think it was episode 19. He's got a fantastic story. He's in a strapped to a chair in a coliseum and in a desert-like sand setting, and it's a broken like Roman Colosseum style. And there's this old babushka type woman and she's wearing a little, a little um, head, head scarf. It's like a checkered pattern. And she walks towards him slowly and starts snipping off his fingers with uh, wire cutters. I tried on my a best positive technical note. difficulties and, oh, well, just, he, no, he was no, like, no, he had no negative feelings about this dream. Whoa. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. I would, but go on. We could not make heads or tails of that. He didn't feel threatened by it. He felt no pain. As each finger came off, was snipped, he, he was more curious about it, and sand poured out. It's the same sand that was burying part, part of the chair and part of his feet. This was, if you want to watch me completely fail to get any kind of a <laughs> useful understanding, watch episode 19 entitled, uh, ironically, intentionally, Going Nowhere, because he was strapped to a chair and going nowhere, and we went mm. nowhere with that. We, we were not able to get an understanding. That might be probably my greatest failure, might be my favorite dream in that sense. Like, man, that challenge huh. stumped me. I, I, I gave him nothing of use, which I felt terrible about. Now I look back on it like I, that needed to happen. Maybe I needed to get a little humility. You're not, uh, wizard doesn't always cast the right spell. It just happens. <laughs> 
I think it's very interesting that I just asked you about one of your favorite experiences. And on the one hand, you shared that it's really, I guess I would I would say maybe like euphoric to have an experience where you, you're hitting the nail on the head and you're really helping someone go someplace. Oh, yeah. And also that there are dreams that can be fantastical, that can be wonderful. But you actually cited an experience that sounds like a dream that I wouldn't want to have and uh, an unsuccessful experience. So I'm curious what made that your favorite. And also if you have any favorites where you felt like you really did get somewhere or that the content of the dream was fun to work with. Yeah, that's um, that was what my memory threw up as an example of, of an experience worth sharing. Hmm. I can't say why and why in the context of favorite. What is it about failure that I felt enjoyable? There's something in my mind where I look at you learn more from failure and learning of learning new things, getting mm. getting a different perspective from an experience is something incredibly valuable to me. I don't like failure. It's motivation to try harder or do better next time. So there's that aspect to it. But I'm also not afraid of it necessarily, which, you know, putting your face on the Internet and doing this thing where I'm recording live. I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what they're going to say. This could all go to shit. Uh Pardon me, you can bleep me if you need to. There is there is something exciting and, about that and the unknown potential of, yeah, that euphoria of puzzle solving. You've got those little um, little metal and wood puzzles that, you man, you just, you worry at it and you try different angles and all of a sudden the two pieces come apart because you found the trick. That moment of discovery is like amazing. And the potential for having those experiences with other people's dreams is like, I could do this for the rest of my life and mm. never be disappointed or, or talking mm. to someone. You also asked, let's see what a favorite success. This brings an example. So I did, um, I've got multiple playlists on my channel. I've got my What Dreams May Come, which was borrowed from Shakespeare, borrowed from the Robin Williams movie. Uh, ref it references death, but it's also, well, what dreams are going to appear on this channel? It's my little teaser trailer channel. It's just the dreamer telling the dreams. So you can use that to find a dream on the Dreamscapes playlist, which is the full interviews. I've also got my Dream Wizard plays. I just play video games and and, and drink uh, because, and I restrict my drinking to my video game playing time. Uh, but there's also my ABC series, the ABCs of Dream Interpretation. I, I titled it Augury, Bibliomancy, and Chaos because augury, divining meaning, bibliomancy from knowledge, and the chaos of, I don't know what's going to happen. Dreams are chaotic until understood. Um, long story short, too late for that. Uh, one of the episodes I did was was the first my first attempt to do this kind of thing. It was a longer form 30-minute episode of debunking the dream dictionary approach. And the reason I, I get into that is that I I, un I appreciate the spooky woo side of things, and that sounds derogatory. It's not what I mean, but it's the supernatural. It's without physical cause. It can't be distilled and into science. And that's kind of where the dream books come from. They come from this one-size-fits-all understanding. They give specific meaning. So what I do in this episode, I took a dream example of a young lady who was having nightmares about her mother. Uh, or one nightmare she brought me featured her mother and specific symbols. And I said, let's take all of the dream elements, uh, Bill Domhoff style, list them out, and we're going to go and we're going to compose two different narratives from the information available in one instance of a dream dictionary online. And we got two completely radically different stories mm. possible. One of them I composed only from that material to to be as close to the interpretation she and I arrived at together. The other one, completely wrong in every possible way, all the opposites or just things that didn't apply to her because with lacking a conversation. So why was this one of my favorite dreams? I was able to offer comfort to the mm -hmm. person, a sympathetic ear to her problems mm -hmm. and a, a better understanding of her situation and what these images meant to her in a way that took the fear out of the nightmare as much as possible. Mm. But also, so what happened with this, why do I mention the episode that I, that I made of the ABC series? It was episode 14 or something like that. If I were not available, if she could not have brought this dream to me, if she had instead gone to the dream dictionary, there was a chance she was going to get 
that entirely wrong understanding that I composed on purpose by just picking out random things and saying, this means that, this means that. Mm. If she had followed that advice, it would have inspired a traumatized victim of abuse to seek out, um, lean into seeking sexual relationships as a mean of means of uh, comforting mm. herself. Mm-hmm. That was the interpretation from the dream dictionary. Yeah. Very bad advice in my estimation. Something I would not recommend she do. So mm. in terms of one of my favorites, it would be because I think I had the most beneficial impact on that specific person, mm-hmm. helping them avoid a very bad outcome. And not only that, but giving them maybe a path forward to dealing with real trauma mm-hmm. in their life. Mm-hmm. It doesn't get better than that in my estimation. Mm-hmm. You know, that just validates my entire experience. Maybe I was put mm-hmm. on earth to do that and mm-hmm. now I can just coast. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Well, as a therapist, I can relate to, to how fulfilling it is to really help people. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to ask you about lucid dreaming. Yeah. How common is it? What yes. is it? What are the myths and facts about lucid dreaming? Yeah. That is one of those things where I set it a little bit to the side. I'm aware it's a phenomenon. I don't know what to make of it. Same with prof- prophetic dreams. People say they have them. I've got a friend in real life, know the guy, lives just a few, like a mile away. He said, I dreamed a thing. Every single thing in order that happened in that dream happened to me less than a week later. I'm like, I don't know what to do with that. That's, wow, that's amazing. Uh, that's, and not wow in like a d- uh, dismissive way, but like outside of my wheelhouse. And the same with uh, lucid dreams. People say they have them. To my knowledge, I never have. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that experience feels like mm. maybe hmm. maybe mm-hmm. there's there's one dream experience i had one of the few like literally count them on my hand uh that i can recall where the entire dream was me in a cul-de-sac walking towards a busy street and residential neighborhood and i do a little pump with my arms and i slowly fly up and i slowly descend and wake up before I reach the busy intersection at the end. It, it's the entire dream. Mm. To my memory, it feels like I was aware that it was a dream at that time and that I could fly if I wanted to. And so I experimented mm. with pushing against the air, little mm-hmm. gentle flaps with just my hands. Mm-hmm. That would be the closest thing to a lucid experience I've ever had. Mm. But I've had a lot of people tell me. And, and I'm very much aware that people have that experience. So here's where, all the way back to my original thought of the scientific rational versus the sp- spooky woo side of things. It is possible their self-report of the experience is entirely accurate. They are, at in some capacity, aware in their dream and able to direct it. Or they are having the dream experience that they are aware of dreaming, which is its own separate thing, if that makes sense. Yeah. It, it may not be they're actually aware. They're just dreaming they are aware. Yeah. I don't know if there's a difference. Maybe I, there is. <laughs> I mean, that's something worth exploring. I think I've had a little bit of lucid dreaming or lucid dreaming adjacent experiences where like I, I was thinking about how recently I had a dream of a car crash. Some of my dreams are very elaborate. Like I said, it's like, you know, it's like I lived a whole lifetime's worth of experience or a two-hour adventure sci-fi movie. But some of my dreams are short. And this one, I don't remember anything happening before the point of just being in a car. And then suddenly either I'm slamming on the brakes or the driver's slamming on the brakes. I don't remember if I was a passenger or driver, but just seeing we're about to crash in to like the two cars ahead of us. It's about to be a pile up. And becoming aware in that moment, like feeling the fear, like, oh my God, I'm going to die. But also becoming aware that this isn't really happening. And then waking up. Oh yeah. Right. I've, so I've had experiences like that where the slightly lucid aspect of it just kind of helps take the pain or fear out of the experience. I've also had a little bit of the controlling movement and flight, right? I remember years ago being in a room where I could float and just experimenting with like, oh, I can make this go up or down or, you know, the same thing with flying of I think I can go over here. One of my flying dreams recently that was quite fantastical, I was able to control some of the movement where I'm like, oh, I want to go check out this part of the landscape. But then I would just like, oh, now I'm floating downward and I don't really feel like I have that much control over my movement. 
But I think there's a range. For what I what I hear of people who do report a lot of lucid dreaming, there seems to be quite a range. And you know, on the, on the opposite of an end of the spectrum, from my experience, and my experience being like I in the dreams start to become aware that I have some control or that this isn't really happening. You know, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have like I said, my seven year old stepson who can just decide what he wants to dream and either, you know, watch a video that's related to it or just play it out in his head. And this kid has some gifts. He is beyond his years when it comes to physical skills and games. So we will play as a family of four, you know, him and his nine-year-old brother and me and his father. And he wins a, a surprising amount of the time considering that Nobody's trying to make it any easier for him, and he's the youngest. And he goes rock climbing. And I just saw a video of him on a recent rock climbing trip where it was like he did he ascended a rock that the the teacher or facilitator at that place had never seen a child do this particular course before. And he's seven, and he does it twice. Yeah. So this kid, he's he's really gifted when it comes to all things competitive and physical. And and it makes me wonder, does he have, because I think he actually plans out things like obstacle courses that he's interested in and he'll he'll think about something he wants to do and then he'll go practice it in his dreams. And I, I'm really wondering how much this mental skill he has is helping his actual physical skills and problem solving abilities in real life. It's pretty fascinating to witness. Have you ever heard of anything like that before? Oh yeah, that inspires so many thoughts of of different stories. It's hard to keep them all keep them all straight. I should be taking notes. I'm never gonna I'm never <laughs> gonna remember it all. But lucid dreaming. So first thing popped into my head with you describing this kid. I'm thinking Mozart, child prodigy. He was composing stuff wow. at like five years old. Some people are just born with a certain composition and a certain set of circumstances, and the stars align, and man, they can do amazing things <laughs> that others can't ever, or at least way earlier than someone should even mm. be capable of doing something like that. It's such an extreme outlier. Mm -hmm. And that may be, remember the, the wide continuum variety of dream experiences and relate it to the concept that uh, I can't, I'm definitely a wizard of words and not a mathematician. My dad is the architect. Numbers are his thing and not mine at all, but he's up, you know, flip side. So different halves of the brain. So we were, you know, biologically composed, I believe, to have different strengths. And that, I think, relates to dreaming as well, where it's the idea of certain people maybe have more or less of particular kinds of dream experiences because of how their brain's wired. And it shouldn't be surprising at all to us that we have this variety broad uh, range of human diversity, it's going to show up in our dreams as well, our dream experiences. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, I just wonder how much of the, a connection there is with learning, you know, because for instance, when uh, developing a physical skill, you know, like I, prior to getting sick with COVID about a month ago, I had been working out five days mm. a week for three months. So it was a big bummer to experience this crash in my energy because I'm still dealing with post-COVID fatigue where I haven't been able to work out in a month. And I feel like I'm losing that strength. But in talking to my trainer, she talks about muscle memory and the, the role of your brain in affecting your physiology. And that just the fact that I was doing those workouts, my body is still going to remember. So I'm thinking about that mind-body connection and problem solving. And if yeah. we're using dreams to think and solve problems, how far can that go if we're not just working out psychological, emotional, social problems? If we're actually working out physical problems, like how do I how do I play this song or how do I climb this rock? Which just reminded me that I, I've actually For had sure. a couple of awesome dreams where I composed music. Like I had one recently where I had a 12 string guitar that belonged to Yo-Yo Ma. And yes, I'm aware that he's a cellist and not a guitar player. But in my dream, this was Yo-Yo Ma's <laughs> 12 string guitar that he like gave me to play. And I sounded incredible on it. And I also had a dream. Well, I feel like I've had a couple dreams where I composed songs and I think, you know, sleep plays an important role in allowing our brain to consolidate memories. And if I'm playing a song on piano, if I'm kind of messing around with something, then I step away from it. I come back the next day and I'm just better at it. So I wonder for people who are more yeah. oriented towards physical skills or musical skills or things that aren't just about solving stressful problems, but solving creative problems, if dreams can play a role in yeah. forging those connections and developing those skills.
Well, and uh, referencing back to my books for sale on Amazon, yeah. one of the guy was uh, guys was describing the similarity between daydreams and night dreams, and the idea that uh, daydreams seem to be these involuntary, quasi involuntary flights of fancy, where we imagine positive or negative things. You daydream if you're, you're a failure at something, or you daydream you are succeeding at something, and these can be self-soothing or self-protective behaviors moving us towards the positive or away from the negative. But there's also this idea of imaginary rehearsal. And we do that when we're going to give a speech. We try to memorize it. We pull it up. We imagine our inflection. We go through the words. We imagine ourselves in the process of physical behaviors and the steps involved. That rehearsal in our brain absolutely has an effect on our performance ability. And I think the same thing happens in our dreams. And it's amazing to say, uh, you know, with your uh, stepson, that he can program his dreams. Not surprising to me, not something I can do, not something most people can do necessarily. Some people disagree. But I believe, you know, to, to, to put that in his head at night on purpose for the reason of acquiring new skills or rehearsing, that's amazing. That's, that's something mm -hmm. not a lot of people can do. And I believe absolutely beneficial to his ability to then perform. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It'd be cool if, if we could all do that more. Well, this has been such yeah. a fascinating conversation. We covered a lot of ground. I'm just looking at the notes I was taking. I have autism, structure, <laughs> dementia, psychosis, hallucinations, schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorders, hypnagogic and hemtopopic hallucinations, psychosocial illnesses, addiction, fantastical dreams, lucid dreaming, uh, <laughs> how you work. We covered a lot of ground here. I really hope that uh, our listeners were able to follow along or or enjoy our kind of popcorn free association style of what happens when your brain and my brain meet each other. This was so much fun. So tell us about how people can find you and your work and your other offerings. Oh, yeah. So uh, the primary offering is my uh, Dreamscapes interpretation series on YouTube under uh Benjamin the Dream Wizard, uh, also BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com, where I put up uh, podcasts and um, these uh, growing stack of historical dream literature on Amazon. So I'm hoping to really make this my day job. Uh, so mm. I do need folks to, you know, I'll take donations, but I don't want to just live on the generosity of strangers, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I want to offer people something tangible, educational on top of what I do. So if you're going to do anything to support me, uh, it's buy the books because you're going to get something mm -hmm. valuable out of it. Something I put a lot of work into and uh, mm -hmm. something I think you'll really enjoy. Okay. That's, and That's the basics. And if somebody wanted you to interpret a dream, it seems like you have guests on your YouTube channel who are volunteers. I'm also curious if, if someone wanted a private session that wasn't on YouTube, would you allow them to pay you for that service? I, I would. And I, I have, I've been toying with the idea of what that would look like. So I, I've set up a uh, locals, locals account that I think I might have sent you in the email that if that community grows and if people are interested in that, because I, I bet there's a lot of people out there that want, might want an interpretation, but they're afraid to go on camera. I hear that a lot. They don't want their personal business out there. The dream was embarrassing to them mm. and they would just rather handle it privately. Mm -hmm. My problem is I'm not looking to turn this into a into a cult where they come and ask me for advice and pay me and I oh, take people's money. I'm very, very skeptical and I'm very, I'm very ethically averse to taking money for doing this at all. But if someone wants a private dream experience, I can't turn it into an episode. Mm -hmm. I probably have to monetize it in some way mm -hmm. and give people what they pay for privately, mm -hmm. you know, a couple hours uh, talking to me. I, so that's, that's something on my radar as a potential, but I haven't had anyone offer well, offer yet. So we'll, you see. Know what? we'll see if someone wants to give Well, me money. then I'm glad I brought it up because I think you should consider it. I mean, you're trying to make this your day job and everyone's got to make a living. You put a lot into what you're doing with your YouTube and website and uh, books. And so if people are curious, there's so much of your work online that they can access for free. They can really get a sense for who you are, how you work, and see for themselves if they think that a private session with you would be valuable. And then I don't think that's cult-like at all. I think it's it's not therapy, but it's like a coaching or consultation of any kind, except you come with this really unique skill set of helping people interpret their dreams. So I would suggest that you allow people to pay you for your gifts <laughs> as well as, you know, monetizing your efforts because- I Honestly, I think I honestly need that encouragement because it's not it's not something that comes natural to me asking 
for compensation in that way. So I appreciate it. I do. Thank Someday you. <laughs> I'm going to do an episode on overcoming anti-capitalism for aging bleeding hearts. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> like at some point you realize you got to take care of yourself and hating the system doesn't do anything for anyone. If you, so <laughs> if, you, if you got a skill and people like it, you might as well make it a business. You know, yeah. and that, if, as long as you're giving something of value, that's the it's got to be valuable or of course no one would want to pay for it. So as long yeah. as they want to pay for it, maybe it's valuable. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, Benjamin. Well, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you again. And wishing you all the best. So listeners, if you're curious, go find Benjamin, maybe even get a dream interpreted or read some ancient literature. I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist podcast with Stephanie Wynn, LMFT. This podcast is produced by Eric and Amber Beals at Different Mix. Special thanks to the talented musician Joey Pecorero for our theme song, Half Awake. At SomeTherapist.com, you can find more information on any topic, guest, resource, product, or service you've heard of here today. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram at SomeTherapist. If you would like to ask a question, suggest a topic, be a guest, or invite me to speak, you can email us at hello at SomeTherapist.com. You can also send us a voice memo with your question, and we just might play it. Of course, just because I'm some therapist doesn't mean I'm your therapist. This podcast is not a substitute for medical advice. If you need help, ask your doctor or browse your local therapists online. And whatever you do next, please take care of yourself. Eat well, sleep well, move your body, get outside, and tell someone you love them. You're worth it.